Well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's simulation webinar titled, Not Using FDA in Your Design, You're Doing It Wrong. <laughs> and I know that's a pretty, pretty strong title there, but uh, pretty much the purpose for today is to, to really showcase and uh, demonstrate how incorporating SOLIDWORKS simulation into your normal day-to-day uh, -day design process can be beneficial and cost-effective within, you know, uh, being able to predict some of the, the issues that you may come across within your design. And for any of those who may already be using simulation, it's really just reinforcing, you know, the fact of incorporating an analysis tool, uh, you know, again, how it can be beneficial. My name is Silvio Perez. I am the Simulation Product Manager for Hawkridge Systems. Uh, I've been with Hawkridge Systems now for about eight years now and been utilizing simulation throughout the, the course of the, the eight years uh, in my time here at Hawkridge and definitely come across a variety of different problems, a variety of different customers with, with many different uh, issues uh, that may come across within simulation. So uh, definitely, uh, hopefully um, you guys are to able to get something good from, from this presentation. Again, as far as what we're going to cover today, uh, really just introducing, starting off here, uh, as far as what is analysis? You know, what is this term and, and how do we utilize that in our design process? And how is it there to help you? you know, how, how can it, you benefit from utilizing this analysis process? And in, in turn, we're going to be able to answer why do we do FEA in general? And why specifically with SOLIDWORKS simulation and with your added, your partner here of Hawkridge system. And then we'll transition over here to a live example of uh, how you can test your design and hopefully, you know, start simple and gradually make it better by utilizing some of the techni techniques available within the simulation tool. And then we'll end it here with uh, a couple or offering or demonstrating some of our offerings here in terms of training and services that we have available that are specific to SOLIDWORKS simulation. So one thing to, to kind of note is that SOLIDWORKS simulation, although it is its own entity, uh, it is part of uh, being able to first adopt SOLIDWORKS CAD, right? It's something that's integrated within the tool and you see that uh, we have a variety of different solutions within our portfolio that stem from adopting SOLIDWORKS. So for many of you, I'm assuming that you guys already have SOLIDWORKS as a CAD tool. And there's a variety of different tools, whether you are, you know, part of the data management team or if you're doing electrical schematics or if you're even in the manufacturing and prototyping side of things, there's a lot of different tools here that we can offer that jive really well within SOLIDWORKS and it always starts with that foundation of adopting that SOLIDWORKS tool. And SOLIDWORKS simulation is no different and which is going to be the topic for today and, and really the focus of, you know, once we adopt SOLIDWORKS, how can we take that design process to the next level? And if we expand on that branch a little bit more, you see that we have a lot of different product tools available that just fall under the category of analysis. Today, it's going to focus a little bit more on the FEA side of things, where we're going to be focusing on the structural side. But ultimately, you see that maybe you have a different mode of failure. Maybe structural is not a concern. Maybe it's how hot something's getting or seeing how, how much air is going to be distributed within a channel. Right? That's where SOLIDWORKS flow simulation comes into play, which is our computational fluid dynamics tool. Again, it's in the same category of fully integrated within the CAD tool. It's just a simple add-in that you turn on if you have access to that license. Or maybe that's not a concern either, and you have, uh, again, you're on the manufacturing side, and you are part of the injection mold team, right, where you have a lot of back and forth between you and the mold maker where, you know, you want to get your design to a point where it's filled, uh, the cavity can fill. That's where SOLIDWORKS Plastics can really uh, benefit from, from that functionality of being able to predict whether those cavities will fail or pass within a filling standpoint, being able to simulate different runner systems and being able to predict that versus you having that back and forth and actually manufacturing it uh, and then come to find out that there is an issue. All right, so those three, the FEA, the CFC, and the injection mold, those are, you know, the, the three main products there that are, you know, go hand in hand within the SOLIDWORKS CAD. But it doesn't solve everything, 
you know, it's, it's going to be very difficult. There is a threshold for each of these tools. But luckily for us, we do have more advanced tools like Simulia Abacus or Simulia Explo, where those are more of our advanced uh, tool sets where we'll be able to answer more complicated structural studies or more complicated fluid dynamic issues there where, you know, we can take those fundamental ideas from those root, uh, root products that we have and take it to the next level with these uh, uh, other advanced tool sets here. So we have a variety of different uh, ways to, to solve your answer or solve your problems to be able to predict these failures, and that's really the basis of utilizing the analysis tool there. For those of you who are doing handcuffs or for any mechanical or any engineering there that, that you know, remember your schooling, you, you have those beam form, uh, equations that you follow to, to get your basic displacement and stress, and really, you know, what if your design is not just a simple beam? You know, 99% of the time is not going to be that, right? 99% of the time is going to be something more complex. So designing based off doing simple hand calcs can only get you so far, right? And that's where if you have a complex 3D CAD geometry and you throw it into this FEA platform, it's able to predict that main unknown of how much it wants to deform or how much it wants to stress. Right? Or again, how hot things are getting. The, the, the basic hand counts that you're doing are maybe the, the theoretical things that we learned in school. Uh, and when we're getting that, you know, yeah, again, that we learned in school that can only take us so far. So once you have anything more complicated beyond just a beam for this example, that's where the FEA uh, tools can be very helpful. Now, the second one here, which was the, the highest, which was we design based on experience. And I already mentioned that, you know, as far as maybe, you know, you just know it works. You know, you've done it for years, you know it works, but, you know, is it cost effective? You know, are you designing in a way where you're over designing it? You're making it too strong to overcompensate just, just to make sure that everything is okay. You know, so the question to ask there is, can you reduce material costs? Can you still meet your design criteria, your strength criteria as well, reducing the amount of material that you're utilizing. Or maybe not just reducing the amount of material, but just changing the material altogether. You know, maybe you can get something that's cheaper and just as strong, or just as strong enough to meet that criteria that you may have, that you need to meet. Right. And for those of you who chose we prototype and do a real life, test, real life testing, well, that's great. You know, that is the ultimate answer. There's no, there's nothing better than actually testing it out in the field, prototyping it up, mocking it up, and doing real life testing and getting that real data. You know, one thing that I want to point out is that these analysis tools by no means are a way to replace that real life testing. There's just, there's no comparison there. However, you know, how many times a year do you do that real life testing? Can you reduce the amount of real life testing by being able to virtually test it in your machine there with SOLIDWORKS? Right? If you can, simulate or get results that are comparable to what you're seeing in the field or in that real life test, then you can gain more confidence in terms of, well, what if I do make this part thicker? Or what if I do make this material aluminum versus steel? Does it still meet my criteria? So you'll see that, you know, if you do a top simulation, that doesn't mean it's going to replace your real life testing. And sometimes you need to do that anyway. I've seen a lot of customers who incorporate both. But at the end of the day, what the analysis tool is going to be able to do is reduce the amount of prototyping that you may have to do. It's a lot easier for you to make that material change or make that thickness change within your virtual CAD geometry, of course, versus you actually making it. So which one is more cost effective? Which one will save you more time, therefore more money? So those are the type of things that we kind of look at and, and what you need to consider before adopting or, you know, you know, as far as considering adopting an analysis tool there. So the question then becomes, why specifically SOLIDWORKS simulation? You know, our line of simulation products allow customers to predict failures using finite element analysis tools early on in the design process to reduce the amount of prototyping and physical testing therefore allowing you to iterate through many design changes. And that's the goal. It's being able to reach that failure point a lot quicker and cheaper and just, you know, more cost effective. You know, how do you know your thing is good enough 
without having to go through that extensive process. Well, that's where SOLIDWORKS simulation is, comes into play because why? For one thing, we can test for a lot of different modes of failure, whether it's just a basic linear static to a very complex dynamic loading condition, or maybe even just a thermal case, or maybe you want, maybe it does survive that initial case, but you want to see whether how long it's going to survive. How many cycles, how many load cycles can this endure before it starts failing? You see that we have a variety of different tools, like we mentioned. We have the, the CFD, the FEA, the injection mold, and those advanced tools. We have a lot in our tool set. But the great thing about SOLIDWORKS simulation is that really it's integrated within the CAT. Right? You are already familiar with SOLIDWORKS. You are hopefully having uh, an easy time picking up. Uh, it's an intuitive tool to pick up in terms of your, your, your CAD uh, practices there. Right, so if you're already utilizing that tool, you're already familiar with that, then follow, integrating our analysis tools is not going to be any different. It's a shorter learning curve, yet still powerful enough to give you the results that you are after. And really the key thing here is that second major bullet is that integrated process where we're able to in, in, incorporate a faster turnaround time to be able to answer those what if questions. What if I do make that material aluminum? What if I do make this component thicker or thinner, right? It's being able to be able to address those what-if conditions a lot faster versus having to go through that, you know, that long process that we discussed earlier. You know, and, and it's a best-in-class tool, you know, it's, it's definitely uh, known and used for uh, in, in a variety of different industries, a variety of different companies, and it's something that is taught within our, our colleges now. It's something that's incorporated in, in, in our new engineers that are coming up into the industry. So, you know, very popular and you know, just as good as any, any other tool that might be available there. But the key thing here as far as not only why follower simulation, but why specifically Hawkward system is, well, you're already working with us there. We're already your, your solution provider for technical support. Uh, and in, adopting simulation is not going to be any different. You know, we, again, we offer consulting, we offer training, mentoring, you know, we have access to those more advanced analysis tools. We will be there to guide you in the right direction to be able to make sure the tools is not only appropriate for what you're trying to do, but to give you the answer that you're after. Right. So how does that look like in terms of the structural tools that are incorporated for SOLIDWORKS simulation? Well, just like the SOLIDWORKS CAD, it comes in three tiers, standard, professional, and premium. Standard gives us our basic level linear static analysis, being able to predict, um, you know, our very basic, you know, structural study there. In addition to giving you that fatigue analysis of being able to see whether it fails after a certain number of cycles. But we have kind of a stepping stone process here where you can upgrade to simulation professional, which gives you those capabilities in addition to other modes of failure in terms of, you know, whether vibration is a concern with frequency or or maybe a basic level thermal analysis to see how the heat distribution of your model is. Uh, and what's great about it is that it incorporates optimization capabilities where it allows you to be able to iterate different parameters that you may want to control or change and optimize to a specific goal to, let's say, minimize the mass. So there's a lot of niche study types that are available within Simulation Professional that help, again, predict different modes of failure. And then we can graduate to simulation premium, which will give you everything you see on your screen, and being able to predict those more complicated dynamic loading conditions, or if you're working with inherently nonlinear materials like plastics or rubbers, we'll be able to predict those structural uh, results utilizing those more unique material models or load conditions. Right? So again, this is kind of the breakdown of just the SOLIDWORKS structural tools that are available. Now, that's kind of my, um, you know, what I had for you in terms of really hopefully planting the seed as far as, you know, why are you sitting in this presentation? You know, why analysis can be beneficial and more so why SOLIDWORKS simulation? Now what I'm going to transition here to is uh, showing you a live demonstration of how this works, how it's integrated within your CAD. And one thing, you know, more so if you're, if you're already utilizing a tool, we utilize this, uh, <laughs> this kind of thought process of starting simple crawling, then walking, then running, right? So this crawl, walk, run concept where we start off really simple and then we add complexity to it. 
to be able to again a stepping stone of answering our basic result or our basic answers that that we are achieving you know is it strong enough if not what if i make this change and then adding from there so that's what we're going to see here within this live demonstration so uh, i am utilizing SOLIDWORKS uh, 2019 here and uh, the model that we see here is a very basic engine if you will with the piston the connecting rod and the actual crankshaft so a three-part assembly there and we want to simulate and see how strong this connecting rod is going to be if we impose an 800 pressure on the top face of this piston. So right now we're in the SOLIDWORKS CAD environment. We're in inside an assembly here. Incorporating simulation is very simple. All it is is just a simple add-in that we turn on. And when we turn that on, it wakes up a few options allowing us to incorporate and be able to define that overall setup as far as replicating how this engine or how these components are restrained in the real life scenario and how it's loaded in the real life scenario okay so i will be setting this up from scratch i do have some results here that i can load in um, so don't wait too long but once we're in the simulation tool set we just can incorporate a brand new study and depending on what license type you have from what we saw on the previous page that's where you get access to, to those different uh, study types in this case we always kind of recommend starting with if it's a structural uh, study kind of starting off with the linear static again starting in the crawling phase of just a simple analysis to see you know again answering that basic question of how strong is my component All right so you know this will be run one let's call it we can hit okay and just like that we've just created a brand new simulation study he saw that we didn't launch a brand new product. We're not dealing with a different interface. We're just one click away of being able to edit any of these features that are that relate to these individual components. So this is the key thing here is that simulation is integrated within that CAD, being able, making it easier to take advantage of those CAD features and being able to change your design process a lot faster. And one of the nice things about that is that notice that we kind of follow this tree, follow this process of setting up uh, defining these major categories that are defined within now your simulation tree here but notice that the first thing here is just showing us the parts that are associated within that simulation project and it's those three components that make up this assembly and it already has a green check and a, and a material assigned to that where it's really just saying you added that material at the model level when you created that brand new study I'm figuring out that you want to use those same materials and I do right so again there's already that integrate or you're seeing the benefit of that integration of the materials automatically getting transferred over of course you have the option here to update it to create your own material uh, being able to iterate through different materials that we'll see on here later on so we can skip that step at that point because it's already been done for us and then automatically what's nice about simulation is that for all the faces that are already touching, it's assuming that things are bonded together, that things are, are glued together, that they won't be able to separate from each other. And, and that's very critical here because, you know, within the real life scenario, you, you know, things are moving along relative to each other. Simulation gives you the opportunity to define how those bodies are going to interact with each other. And there are these great default options that are already available to you. As you see, as I started a new study, it assumed that everything here was assumed bonded which means glued together but we have nice techniques here where we even if your model does have gaps within your uh, your assembly you can easily say that for any gaps that are within a certain range that you define here you can include you know have it automatically assume that it's a bonded condi uh, condition that those areas of the model are glued together even though they are you know have a gap so you don't really have to spend much time having to make sure that those mates are or that, that the thicknesses of those parts are actually touching the neighboring parts uh, simulation will try to figure it out with some of these options here we will leave that as default here in this case just for simplicity's sake but then moving forward you have techniques here where you have to restrain the model you know you can't just have the model free floating in space it needs to know what the stiffness is of this geometry not only due to the material but how it's, you know, what degrees of freedom you are allowing it to move or not move, right? And that's where fixtures comes into play here. And we're gonna throw in a couple of fixtures that are really simple. The first one here is the fixed geometry, uh, pretty much assuming that 
uh, whatever face selections that I make, it's not going to translate or rotate about X, Y, and Z. So I'm going to say that for these five faces here of the crankshaft are fully restrained. Essentially, we're, we're going to simulate the strength of this uh, piston rod here at that instant in which it's in that position and locked in that position there. Right? So very easy that I'm able to graphically select the areas that I'm essentially uh, defining the degrees of freedom. What area of the model am I keeping it from moving or translating or rotating? Right, so, and what's nice about this is that even if you miss something, you make a mistake, you say, oh, you know what, I need to go back. Just like SolarWorks uh, CAD, you're easily, you're able to right click on those definitions, edit those definitions, and adjust accordingly, right? You're never locked in into a situation where you can never go back, right? The other thing here is that a lot of these picture types are very intuitive to use. You really just have to ask, you really just have to ask yourself, you know, what degrees of freedom is this thing able to move? Well, in this case, we're assuming that it's just a snapshot of it rotating at this position and us applying a pressure on top of that piston. Well, in that case, all I really wanted to allow it to move is be able to allow movement in the axial direction. And you can, you can easily define that. So when we go into the fixtures again, we can go and take advantage of the fact that, or recognize that this is a cylindrical body at this point, and we can now control the degrees of freedom of that cylindrical body, pretty much saying that we want to restrain any radial movement or any circumferential movement and only allowing that thing to move up and down. So very easy to define where I can just say, well, for the radial movement here, looking at the animation, we are able to restrict that movement by just leaving it at zero millimeters. And enabling the circumferential, pretty much saying that for those two directions, they are not allowed to move. And the only thing, the only degree of freedom that's allowed to move is in the axial direction, right? So we have a lot of simple techniques, uh, a lot of simple ways to, to define how this thing is able to move, right? And the nice thing about SOLIDWORKS simulation is that even if this is your first time running an analysis, you may not know what degrees of freedom have been accounted for or may be missing. Maybe it's, it's under constrained. Well, we have techniques here where we can specify and find where the unconstrained bodies are, where we can easily see, you know, what degrees of freedom are able to move. So a lot of great techniques there that are available to us. And ultimately, in this case, it's running a check. And from there, you know, it's going to tell us whether things are fully constrained. And it is. And it says that the model is fully constrained. And that's what we want to see. Essentially, we don't want any open, under constrained bodies and we have nice features within simulation to demonstrate that. So very nice that we have that there. So I'm confident that we've at least restrained it properly. Now we have to incorporate how this is gonna be loaded. Well, we have a variety of different techniques that we have. We can incorporate just a simple force or a pressure, or if you're dealing with a large structure, we can incorporate gravity where the, the mass of the model can impose a load on itself. So we have a lot of different ways, or maybe you don't know how much force there is, but uh, you know how much it needs to move, you can incorporate a prescribed displacement as well. Right? In this case, we're going to incorporate pressure. Pretty much assuming here that pressure is going to go down on that piston uh, in the downward direction there. And I can change my units on the fly depending on what information we have the values in. So if I go to PSI, I want to say that this is going to see a pressure load of 800 PSI. So we take a look at those visual uh, the annotations there, and you see that it's going down in the appropriate direction. So that is our basic setup of this scenario. So again, you may find it, well, that's a very simple example, but you see that we have the tools available to pretty much replicate how this would be restrained in the real case scenario, right? The more advanced model you have, that doesn't matter. We have those techniques to be able to set that problem up. Now, the nice thing about this is that SOLIDWORKS, especially if this is your baseline study, uh, you have techniques here where you can break down the model into these small chunks, which is what we call a mesh. And that's very important because that's what creates the results. From those mesh elements, we, we derive the result of displacement and stress. And depending on your geometry type, whether you're dealing with sheet metal or weldment beams, we have appropriate mesh criteria there to make your study run more efficiently and still giving you those results that you want and need, right? In this case, we're just assuming your traditional basic level, 
uh, solid elements here. And what's nice is that if you're starting off new, you don't really have to worry about this too much where we can start off with the default size that it finds appropriate for the actual model. You may have to adjust this depending on you know, the complexity of the model, but this is a good starting point where you see when we run that analysis, it's just breaking that down that assembly into these small chunks. Right? What's great about this is if there's a specific component or a specific face that you want to add more resolution to that, you have those techniques by adding a mesh control to say, well, there's a specific area that I want more mesh elements. Therefore, it gives you up the opportunity for you to run the analysis again more efficiently. So SOLIDWORKS simulation or SOLIDWORKS in general, it's all about efficiency, getting your results quicker, faster, in a quick turnaround time, and it has technique to, to simplify that for you. All right. So once that we have that meshed, we can run the analysis. You know, I just want to show you that it's running live, and in this case, it ran under five seconds, right? And this is a good way to really see the the what it's able to do in a baseline study. Of course, if you want to add more resolution to it, it's going to extend the runtime there, but ultimately, you know, it's able to to give us the results fairly quickly. Now, the first one that we always want to review here is the displacement. We want to ask yourself, you know, is it deforming the way we'd expect? We take a look at that value and we say, you know, based on how it was restrained, based on how it was loaded, you know, does that value make sense? Or maybe you relate that back to, you know, a real life test that you may have done. But what's nice about this is that we have great tools like the animate tool to really see how this thing wants to deform and at least visually it's answering the question of, yes, I did set this up correctly. It's deforming the way I would expect. Now you may be thinking, wow, that's actually deforming a lot. That's a little concerning. Well, visually it's deforming a lot, just more so because it's exaggerating the deformation scale for you to actually see that it is deforming in that direction. But of course we can incorporate the, the numeric value here and seeing that it's really just moving 0.1 millimeters. So not significant and that seems to be enough. Now, very simple here. Again, you don't have to be a degreed engineer to really to, to use this tool. You don't have to be an analyst to be able to use these tools. Do that, does that help? Of course. But if you're just a designer, normal normal day-to-day -day designer, and you don't have experience with FTA, this can still be beneficial and useful to you. There's a lot of good information here to at least answer the basic question of is this strong enough? One of them is based on looking at the stress. So when we look at the stress, we take a look at, and there's a variety of different stress components that you can review. Uh, you know, again, if you don't, if you're not familiar with this, we can stick with the default Balmisa stress, which is really just looking at the equivalent stresses of your model here in all directions of X, Y, and Z. And the way we use this or how we can utilize this is a couple ways. For those of you that need to meet a certain criteria, we look at the max stress and see whether it has exceeded the yield point of the material. So with every material here, there's a specific strength property, the yield strength, where we compare you know, that value. So with the MPA here, we see that the yield strength is about 248 MPA, and we relate that to what the max stress is for those individual components for those unique materials. Right? So that's, what, that's the way we interpret that result to see whether things are starting to yield or things are starting to break down. If they exceed that value, then we have a problem. But maybe you don't really understand that concept or you're not familiar with it. We have techniques here to show you what's called the factor of safety. So very simply, we can go into the results and incorporate a factor of safety. And all you really need to know is that number essentially needs to be at least above one or one and above. Right, having a value there below one is essentially saying in this case, where the factor of safety is 0.46, it only took in about 50% of the load before it started to fail, before the, it reached that strength property. So if this was your extreme case scenario where the, the max pressure that this is gonna see is 800 pounds, this is saying already that we have an issue. And all it's really doing in the background is comparing automatically the max stresses that it's seeing for the individual components to the yield strength of that overall uh, assembly there as well. So somewhere within the model, essentially, it has a minimum factor safety of 0.46, and that's a problem. So again, 
you can be you, you can know what those stress components mean or you can be just you can just relate to this plot type and see whether we have any issues and essentially relate it back to this factor of safety. So what do we do now? You know, at this point, I'm glad I ran this in FEA and caught it to, because if I would have made, uh, have them manufacture this, again, manufacturing a crank, uh, connecting rod and piston, that's gonna be a costly process to come to find out that it can't even endure that 800 PSI, that's a big problem. Now, in this case, how do we try to make this better? Where's our stepping stone here? Now, what's nice about this, considering that this is integrated within the CAD, is that I can easily make a copy of this study and call this run to, and what this does is it makes a unique study, and at this point, I can change anything about this study and rerun it without having to do any uh, re-setup of the problem itself. And maybe what I wanna do in the second study is change the material. And more specifically, the one that really was showing us the most stress was that connecting rod. So maybe I wanna change it from the cast carbon steel to something a little bit more unique. Well, I can easily edit that material. Uh, you see that this was pulled from the original SOLIDWORKS database. So it's the same database that's being used uh, within your normal CAD if you utilize that on already. But we of course have the opportunity here to create our own custom material, make something a little bit more unique or something that may not exist within the actual SOLIDWORKS database. So maybe I wanna change that connecting rod here. Let me just make sure, yep, the connecting rod uh, for that component. And I wanna utilize this custom material here that I named it as a, a new powdered metal, right? With the yield strength here, if we change this to MPA, 661 MPA. So you're seeing that the yield strength is a lot stronger. This material is stronger. So if I apply and close, that's it. That's all you have to do. We change the material. And all the setup there was copied over from that initial run. And at this point, I can just rerun the analysis. And even those plots that I created were, are transferred over as well, where I don't need to define them again individually. So you see that from there, we can review those displacement results. But if we take a look at just the factor of safety, well, we made a gradual increase there. We made it a little bit better, where the minimum factor of safety is now 0.58 from 0.46. So you see, this is how we can incorporate those different design changes very easily, how I can just easily say this is now a different material, All right? So um, the other thing here, um, you know, what's, what's nice about this is, uh, is at this point we can incorporate, what if I make a design change? What if I make something thicker just to make it a little bit stronger? Well, in this case, I can go back into my model and I can open up that connecting rod individually and I can leverage and take advantage of uh, configurations and being able to pretty much change something, change something about the design and have it be linked to a unique configuration. So what if I create a new configuration here at the part level uh, and I'm gonna call it thicker two here. So I'm gonna make something a little bit thicker. So when I hit okay, I can go back to my feature tree and really what I wanna make thicker is this extrusion of this profile here. So if I edit the definition of that feature, you see that I'm changing the model. And maybe I wanna input this or change this to 7.5 at this point to so make it a little bit thicker. But you see, because we're incorporating different configurations, I can say that I only wanna make this change for this unique configuration. So when I hit okay, it updates the model there for that unique configuration. So when I go back to the assembly, it detects that there, a change was made so it updates the model. But now what I can do in this case is create a secondary configuration at the assembly level that links to that new config that I did at the part level. All right, so if I call this again, thicker two, now at the assembly level, you see how I'm incorporating uh, configurations and I can take a look at that connecting rod and say well for this one I want to link it to that new design here and hit OK and you see that it updates the assembly for that configuration and you see that I can go to the default and you see it's linked to that thinner one If I go to thicker two it's linked to that thicker one now and the great thing about this is that I can still copy over from the original configuration or the original study but now reference that updated change so if I make a copy of that run uh, first, or excuse me, I'll just do it from run two, 
make a copy from there because I want to still keep that material. I can call this run three, but now I want to reference that thicker two configuration. So it's a nice way to take advantage of those CAD features and incorporate it within your simulation study. And now you see that it's taken advantage of that thicker component and all those boundary conditions got transferred over. So now when I run this, it's going to mesh and run this model because it's updating the model here. And then from there, we'll be able to review how that affected my overall results. So you see that we're gradually making that change. And ultimately here, uh, what I'm realizing is that I pretty much forgot a feature. And it's something that's uh, very simple to do and to incorporate. I didn't incorporate how the piston is connected to that connecting rod. It's kind of just uh, sitting there. And right now, what I want to be able to do is say, oh, maybe I, I need to incorporate a pin. Maybe that's what's affecting that here. So I can go into my connections and you see that we have our virtual database here of all these different techniques of not having to incorporate bolts or pins or that physical geometry. Really the idea here is if I'm able to, if I don't really care about the stress components of, it, of those individual components, but I want to incorporate the effects of those parts being connected by a bolt or a pin, I can take advantage of these virtual tool sets that are available and that are easy to use. So if I say that I want to incorporate a pin between those components, well, I can incorporate it by just selecting the interfaces here, dictated here by the selection box, and really just defining what, uh, how that pin is able to move, and essentially we're restricting any translation or rotation about that pin, and all I did was just selected those inside faces. Now you see we get a virtual re representation there, and uh, as far as that now there's that pin connection between those components. So if I run that now, we should be able to get a more realistic condition as far as what's happening in real life. And you see that my results slightly changed here already. And ultimately, I was just, I forgot to incorporate that pin, but at least it shows that, hey, you know, even if you forgot to incorporate that pin on your design, you can do it after the fact and update that model very easily, right? But you see that we can take advantage of these virtual connectors without having to incorporate another physical geometry. We have a lot of tool sets here that have virtual components to minimize that analysis process. And ultimately, we see that now we increase that factor of safety to 2.3, and that means that we can double the load and still take into, and, and still be confident that it's strong enough to, in, to receive that 800 pound or pressure that's being applied on the piston, right? So uh, very, uh, a very simple way to showcase that stepping stone process, starting simple with a basic material, maybe changing the material and adding more complexity by changing the actual thickness of the geometry, all within the database. And you saw that I did that live, right? So very simple to do that here, okay? Now, um, the last thing here is, this is structural, structural tool, or, or the structural study here. But again, you know, we have, there may be other modes of failure that we may need to consider, like vibration, or maybe even fatigue. Well, the engine, of course, is operating in a certain RPM range uh, that you can convert to essentially hertz. So what I can do is I can create a brand new study here if you have simulation professional or above, and now I want to test for frequency. Now, what's nice about this is that I can transfer over all these conditions that I already did in the structural sense here and being able to copy them and drag them over to this unique study type. So again, you, you started crawling and now you're getting into this walking running stage where you did the work, you started simple, and now you're adding more complexity and adding a more complex study type. And in this frequency analysis, you may be just wanting to check what are my natural frequencies of this engine or of this structure and will it coincide with what the operating range that this engine is gonna operate in. So if I'm assuming that this RPM range is gonna operate at around 5,000 RPM, which can be translated to 83 hertz, I wanna make sure that my natural frequencies avoid that 83 hertz range. So by there, we can define those materials, define how it's being restrained, and we can run that analysis and we get a different result output. It's no longer just displacement or stress, we get what the natural frequencies are and what the mode shapes are gonna be 
uh, as far as how it wants to deform in those specific frequency points. So when we run that here, uh, again, it doesn't take too long. Uh, in this case, what I'm going to do here is actually, uh, just for the sake of time, I'm going to oh, actually just complete it. And you see, again, it's exaggerated in terms of uh, what the mode shapes are. But we can see at the different frequency points how these things may want to, to vibrate in those different modes. So you see that essentially every aspect of the, of the crank is going to want to vibrate. And that's what we're looking at here at these different results. But ultimately, what we want to compare here is what the natural frequencies are of this structure. So I can easily look at the resonant frequencies and essentially ask myself, does that coincide with what the operating RPM range that this is going to see? And this is well, ex well outside that range. And therefore, I can be more confident that not only is that connecting rod is going to be strong, but the entire structure is not going to vibrate in a critical range of what the operating range is going to be for the structure. Okay. So just kind of showing you how we can go from that basic structural analysis to something a little bit more complicated and therefore uh, just a different result output. We have those different techniques that still relate to one another. It's not just purely structural. It's, you know, in this case, maybe vibration as well. All right. So hopefully um, you see that, you know, as far as how easy it is to set up these problems, how quick it is to run these problems at that first initial pass. Okay, so we're nearing the end here, and uh, ultimately, what I want to discuss here is, even though you know I'm saying that these tool sets are easy to use, easy to pick up, you know, of course, there's always going to be some additional help that you may need, and we have a variety of different simulation offerings available that start off with you know what's available to you for free, and there's a lot of good content on our YouTube channel. If you go to our official website, hawkridge.com, uh, there's a blog portion there where there's blogs of all the products that we have available and, of course, simulation as well. So a lot of good tips, a lot of good things that we've learned throughout the, the course of using this tool, and they're just there available for you for free. Of course, we also have, with your subscription, technical support, which is a good thing to have because they're your first line of defense. Whether you run into an issue, something that you feel like is not working correctly, technical support is there to help you. There are degree engineers that are, you know, that can speak the language, that are familiar with the tool set, and have seen weird things with the tool that will be able to help you out if you come across those. But of course, we also have dedicated training for these topics as well. Again, even though we promote that this is easy to pick up, and it is, but there's nothing better than to be more confident that you're using the tool a smart way the best way possible for these different scenarios. So the guided training there can be done in person or online, uh, and we have a variety of them for those uh, specific topics. And of course, if you have, if you do take the training or if you need more help, we do have mentoring and consulting services available that relate to simulation as well. Uh, that's more of a, you know, sitting with you, you know, one on one, getting a little bit more in depth at your specific problem. You know, and taking those concepts of training incorporated into your specific problem you have, right? So a lot of good offerings here that we have available. And you see that for at least the simulation training, uh, you know, not a lot. Uh, most of our training or our, our training there doesn't exceed uh, a week long. There's just a couple of days, uh, you know, in person at least. If you take them online, they're broken up into smaller chunks. But you kind of see that it doesn't take much time investment for you to get to that next level of learning these tools. So for every product that we pretty much have in the simulation realm, uh, we have a class dedicated for that. Right? So definitely, if that's an interest, let us know. You know, Contact your sales rep there, and they'll be able to guide you in the right direction. But lastly here is really, you know, to kind of put it full circle here, you know, if you're not using FEA, you, know, you may not be doing it wrong, but you know, can you be doing it better? is really what I hope for you to get out of this is, if you're not incorporating that analysis tool, can you make that design process a little bit better and a little bit more efficient? So hopefully that or this presentation kind of showcased that, the benefits of utilizing not only FEA, but SolidWorks Simulation FEA and continuing the partnership with Hawk Systems.